Hey everybody, it's Monika and welcome to my channel where I give social workers, counselors, and helping professionals the information and the resources that you need to deepen your level of self-awareness and to increase your competence and confidence in the profession. Today I'm going to be talking about why I celebrate Juneteenth and why you should too. If you're interested in this video, then please keep watching. I'm Anika Thomas, the founder and clinical social worker at Kendrick Connections Therapy Center. I've been a social worker for over 12 years. I decided to do an entire YouTube channel on my journey from cubicle working social worker to successful entrepreneur. Welcome to my channel. So I wanted to start by giving a brief overview of Juneteenth and then why I think it's important for social workers and then why I choose to honor it as my Independence Day. So Juneteenth is the date throughout the country that African Americans commemorate the last enslaved Africans being freed from chattel slavery. It's a combination of the month of June and the date of the 19th where Union Army General Gordon Granger traveled into Galveston, Texas and read the federal order from the Emancipation Proclamation where Lincoln had signed into law that enslaved Africans were freed from chattel slavery. This was in the year 1863 where approximately 3.5 million Africans were freed from slavery from Confederate states. So since Galveston was in such a remote part of Texas, it took approximately two years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation to announce freedom to the enslaved Africans in Texas. And let's be very clear here. The South was probably in no rush to emancipate their free property. Between Galveston and Houston, there were approximately 250,000 Africans who were still enslaved during that time. And once the announcement was made in 1865, Juneteenth was born. Now this technically was Freedom Day from the Ma'afa, which is a term coined by our elder Marimba Aini to describe the Great Disaster or also the African Holocaust. In March of 1865, the federal government created the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, which was later renamed the Freedmen's Bureau. And the goal of the Freedmen's Bureau was to help the approximate 3.5 to 4 million Africans make the transition into freedom. And it was the help of the Freedmen's Bureau that organized the first Juneteenth celebration in the state of Texas in 1866. And to this day, Juneteenth is recognized as a state holiday in the state of Texas. So shout out to Texas. And with everything that's going on with the protests and the recognition of African Americans and their contribution to the country, Senator John Corrin of Texas is introducing new legislation for Juneteenth to be recognized as a federal holiday. And one of the things that we have to know and understand is that Juneteenth didn't mean true and absolute freedom for previously enslaved Africans. For many of them, they were still forced to work on the plantations for little or no wages. The previously enslaved Africans were also shot and hung for attempting to exercise their right to freedom and demanding the pay in which they earned. And many of the Africans continued to work on the plantation because it was the only life that they knew. So they had to decide to go out on their own with little or no resources or to stay within plantation life where they knew that their needs would be taken care of, despite how badly they had been treated previously to the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. We also have to remember that the Africans were freed with no money, no land, no access to capital. They weren't able to read, write, or count. So because of this, they entered into unfair and exploitive sharecropping agreements and contracts with the plantation owners. These contracts and agreement came with high interest rates, unexpected harvest, and with the plantation owner able to change the terms of the contracts because the slaves couldn't read or write, this created a system of indentured servitude and increased debt. And a lot of these sharecropping agreements lasted well within the 1960s. And some may still be intact in various forms in the Deep South. So I'm gonna leave a link below to a video it's called Slavery After Freedom, and it's going to talk about 20th century slavery and how African Americans within the state of Louisiana were still under a form of slavery well into the 1960s. The video traces the work of genealogist Antoinette Harrell, and she tells the story of one enslaved woman and her family from Louisiana, and her name is May Louise Miller. And I'll leave links below to her story as well. And I'm telling you, it's one of the saddest, gut-wrenching stories that you'll ever see and hear, and you'll probably believe that it's not true. One of the other important aspects of Juneteenth is the flag, and that flag was created by Ben Hyatt. 
and he was also the creator of the National Juneteenth Celebration Foundation. To reflect the celebration slogan, which was a new freedom, a new people, a new star. The banner included a red arc, blue background, and the star of Texas bursting with new freedom throughout the land over a new horizon. Now, the Juneteenth flag is not to be confused with the red, black, and green Pan-African flag. That flag was given to us by the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, who was the founder of the UNIA. And on that flag, the red stands for the blood that unites all of us of African descent, the black is for the people, and the green is for the land and the abundance of natural resources and wealth in Africa. So I don't know if any of you were like me, but I love celebrating the 4th of July. I love the fireworks. I love barbecuing with my family. I love getting together. Um, it was a big deal like any other holiday that I celebrated. I would dress up in my red, white, and blue with my sparkly t-shirts, the whole nine. It was a true family event. But that was before I knew the history and started reading Marimba Ani and Frederick Douglass and his writing around the 4th of July. And although I'm really happy that our ancestors were able to enjoy freedom, coming from chattel slavery to what their idea was going to be of freedom, I couldn't imagine how amazing that must have been for them to make that transition. And the unfortunate part about the commemoration is that many of our ancestors were forced into another system of enslavement through peonage, convict leasing, and sharecropping. So I do like to recognize Juneteenth as an ending to the Ma'afa, again, our African Holocaust, also recognizing there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of re-education that we need to do to make sure that we're advocating and fighting for true freedom. But I do recognize this as a great opportunity for enslaved Africans to be able to leave Southern states and transition into Northern states where they had the ability to create a family for themselves, to create community, to find work and to begin to live a self-fulfilling life. I also understand that this was also their ability to begin working toward their right to self-determination. And had this first step not happened, we wouldn't have more progressive movements such as the Black Power Movement, the Pan-Africanist Movement, or the Civil Rights Movement. Although all of those movements have something good and something bad within their own right, we still have aspects that we need to celebrate in terms of who we were and what we contributed to this country. And the right to self-determination, that is one of the tendons within our social work profession. And the fact that our ancestors were still enslaved when America was celebrating its independence from Great Britain is why I like to hinge on the words of Frederick Douglass. Because of the words of Frederick Douglass, that's why I choose to recognize our fight for liberation, our fight for freedom, and our true independence, which really didn't begin when America got its freedom from Great Britain. So in the words of our great ancestor, Frederick Douglass, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in this year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and ungodly license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass front impotence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and psalmody are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on this earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Then he goes on to say, the 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, but I must mourn. And I'll leave a link below to Frederick Douglass's full speech about the 4th of July. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like, subscribe, or share it. I look forward to staying connected with you and providing you more videos around ways to boost your competence and your confidence in the profession. Thank you all so much and as always, be well.